It is Bitcoin Wednesday. Bitcoin Wednesday, the digital currency revolution in the Netherlands. Register using the link on bitcoinwednesday.com. Hey, thank you so much, everybody. I, I so appreciate you guys inviting me here. I uh, just flew in from Austin, Texas, so I'm really, really excited, and I'm incredibly impressed by this meetup. I've uh, been to meetups all over the world. I was just in Singapore on Saturday, and I was in San Francisco and Silicon Valley a couple days before that. And uh, the, the turnout here, the level of uh, professionalism, and the level of sort of uh, discourse is, is really amazing. So you guys have done a knockout job here. Um, so I'm going to talk about Factum. Factum is a data layer for the Bitcoin blockchain. Um, and uh, bear with me because I just landed about two hours ago, so I'm going to try to string together coherent sentences, but uh, I'll save some, uh, some time at the end for questions. Technical questions are welcome, but um, bear with me as I try to stumble through those answers on a few hours of sleep. So, <laughs> um, so I said, I've been traveling all over the place and uh, meeting with uh, banks and insurance companies and businesses and governments and all sorts of things to talk about blockchain technology and how factory and from the two hours I saw of Amsterdam, it's very beautiful. But this was my favorite place I was in so far. Uh, this is a beautiful beach in Central America. And if you have the keys to their title database, their land title database, this property could be yours. <laughs> the government welcomed us down because they had a major, major problem. Um, they built, uh, the World Bank spent $100 million building them a very expensive Oracle database and digitizing all the title records. And then some corrupt officials got a hold of the keys and started giving themselves to be Trump property. So um, they, we started talking to them about how to make tamper-proof title records uh, using blockchains and how, um, how Factum can help them. So we flew down there and um, this is what a title record looked like in Central America. And you can see it. So this is this is one where they basically just write every title next to each other. There's just basically a long line of them. And this book was falling apart. You can see it sort of taped together. And this is what the record keeping looks like. Um, there's basically shelves and shelves of title books, right? And because now they've got a corrupt database, this is all that's left. And oh my God. they put a lock on the door two days before I showed up. So there wasn't even a lock. You could walk downstairs, you could take a book out of there, you could pull it apart, put new title records in, and suddenly you own this beautiful beachfront property. <laughs> Which is totally crazy, except that this is the way the whole developing world works. Right? This is what it looks like. In fact, 70% of the titles throughout the developing world aren't even in the books. They don't even have records for them, right? So this is insane. This is a totally crazy problem. And uh, Hernando de Soto called it the $9 trillion worth of locked value because you can't really lend on this all that well. A mortgage in the Central American country costs 18% interest for a 10-year loan. Um, and you know, you're lucky if they'll give it to you because the title record's not very good. Um, all of those uh, undocumented properties you can't do contracts against, you can't do mineral rights. It's basically land that you can't really do anything. So they brought us down, and what we can do with Factum, like I said, Factum is a data layer for the blockchain, right? So it's just <coughs> blank paper. You write once, and you never erase. Right? So you can really start building truly tamper-proof records. Big deal for titles, right? Because that's something you don't want to ever have anybody tamper with that system of record. But it turns out that almost every business system has a system of record problem, right? We were talking about privacy earlier. Privacy has a major system of record problem. Uh, talk about uh, accounting or auditing. These are all just basically like big organizations that do nothing but record keeping. And records are only as secure as whoever has the keys, right? So the other thing about Factum is Factum really doesn't do all that much. 
much. <laughs> Um, Factum does practically nothing. Factum is basically just a way to organize hashes and um, take them, Merkle tree them down to a single hash and store that single hash on the blockchain. So basically, Factum collects all the data that you want to do. And we collect it in hashes. You can put regular data in, but it's just getting expensive. Um, and then every 10 minutes, we put an anchor into the Bitcoin blockchain. So we basically piggyback off the security of the Bitcoin blockchain. Right? So there's a big, big argument. It's like the Bitcoin holy war about how big those blocks should be. And the reason is, is because if you start putting all the data into the Bitcoin blockchain, there's just not enough space for it. One megabyte limit means you've got seven transactions a second, which means you basically couldn't possibly run business applications on top of the blockchain. So the whole idea is we built this data layer. And then you can build your title records and your legal applications and your financial apps and your medical records. You can build everything on top of this data layer. Factum is open source. Um, it's open development. Um, it's basically um, you know, designed to make a better Bitcoin blockchain. Um, and it's built on top of it using the security and all that wonderful proof of work that we're getting from the Bitcoin blockchain. So the whole idea, so the way we think about it is it's kind of like a road with uh, these pillars, right? These are our sort of anchors. So imagine this beautiful lush green grass is the Bitcoin blockchain. Um, it's got all the value created by all that wonderful proof of work that all the miners are doing, but it's not really great to build on when you want to drive a car on it. Um, so we build this basically this data layer which organizes and collects the hashes and basically allows you to just pull the data that you want. Um, on top of that. So that's sort of the, the analogy that we use. So, and this is, like I said, the Bitcoin holy war. <laughs> what people like, you know, I, I love Counterparty, they're doing some interesting stuff, and MasterCoin, and a lot of these other projects, but what they're basically doing is they're hacking a way to store extra things into the Bitcoin blockchain as transactions, um, and using some sort of fancy op returns and working with some metadata to basically create this, uh, this bit of a monster. And what we're doing instead is we're saying, let's isolate the cryptocurrency part. Let's let Bitcoin just be pure Bitcoin. And all the data stuff that you want to build on top of it, all these sort of blockchain technology opportunities, um, you can do in something like that. Um, you know, the, the analogy is, you just want to drive a car, you don't want to see what's going on inside of it. Right? And Turns out that that's a really, really useful um, key thing for any company, like any bank, any big, uh, you know, uh, uh, PwC or any consulting company or any insurance company, because they love the blockchain and they are terrified of the Bitcoin. And the reason is, is because uh, regulations are so, so gray. Um, in the U.S., all of the money transfer licenses are um, but criminal statutes, right? So their lawyers are like, you cannot play in cryptocurrency at all. That's why all the banks are very, like, you know, one toe in. The, uh, the first big announcement that was so exciting um, that we heard earlier was the Coinbase $75 million announcement of um, investment. And because a lot of banks are finally putting some, some cash into Bitcoin to explore that. Um, so, but this message is really interesting because now you can really play in blockchain technology without ever having a wallet, without ever having to touch coins, without ever having to, um, you know, sort of play in crypto. Um, which means that we can start taking the conversation away from, like, the coin part and start talking about all this kind of blockchain. technology. So, a couple other examples of things you could do. Uh, uh, so, the cool thing about the Bitcoin blockchain is it's basically a big transparent ledger, right? We know where every transaction came from, we know where every transaction went, we don't know who that transaction belongs to, but it's not too hard to trace back to it, right? And the idea is we can do that same level of transparency for every kind of financial record, for every kind of record keeping, right? It's sort of this idea that, uh, you know, if you did this for Enron, you would know what was going on. <laughs> So, um, you know, in the, in the U.S., just recently, I think a couple days ago, uh, Chase had to pay, J.P. Morgan Chase had to pay $99 million for 
fraudulently man uh, manipulated currency markets, right? In a world with transparent ledgers, you can't do that. Um, there was uh, 500, I think the estimate was $500 trillion worth of fraud in the credit default swap market in 2008. Like, with trans, 500 trillion! That's an insane number. That's like bigger than all the world's economies put together. But the, um, the, with transparent record keeping, you know, on a distributed system, in blockchains, you could suddenly think about like keeping all these banks honest, keeping all these insurance companies honest, keeping all these big financial institutions honest, right? And the other thing you can do is you can catch the bad guys. So in this uh, uh, Central American title problem, um, there's a garbage in, garbage out problem. A title is only as good as the document that you put in. So what we what we did as a solution is the attorney signs off and agrees that it's not fraudulent. We get that captured in the blockchain. Every person who touches that record, we know it's captured in the blockchain. Every step along the way of that record before it becomes officially part of the title, also captured in the blockchain. Now I've got something to take to court. Right? Because how many people went to jail with that $500 trillion worth of fraud? Zero. Right. So, we've got this idea that honesty is subversive. Right? Richard Nixon had to step down because he pulled 15 seconds out of his transcripts. Um, you know, when you start pulling records out and when you start monkeying with records, you should be caught and it's time that those people go to jail. So, that's basically what Factum's up to. Uh, I'm going to open it up to questions. You can ask me technical questions. You can ask me business use case questions. Um, you can ask me about Austin, Texas, which is beautiful. <laughs> Go for it. Yeah, thanks. Uh, re really interesting. Um, I was wondering about what you said, um, that transparency is, is, uh, is really um, it's important and it's always good. And you said something about financial auditing and that things with Enron wouldn't have happened with uh, if everything would have been transparent. The thing is, I think the people within Enron, obviously, but, but also, let's say, in the more honest companies, who say we don't want everything to be transparent because we also have a competitive position to think about, and if our competi competitors know exactly what we're doing, so all the transactions that we're making, it would make it really uh, easy to check, but it would also make it really easy to find out what we're doing. There's a, always a balance between some a lot of, amount of privacy and some amount of transparency, right? Okay. And right now, a lot of what goes on in financial institutions is a black box, right? And part of that is competitive advantage, and part of that is, as it turns out, more and more of these cases come out, that they're, they're basically hiding stuff from their trading partners, right? So, um, like, Factum is built around this idea that you take your private data and you hash it, and then you have a staged revealable secrets, right? You know, I don't have to tell, I can prove that it's mine without giving you that whole document that has your social security number or your ID numbers or your how much money you made and that kind of stuff, right? But um, at some level, you can start building more uh, third-party verified uh, and validated transactions Right, so you don't have the same kind of uh, black box in financial systems. And once regulators start understanding that, that kind of tool, then they can start sort of demanding that the regulations that are on the books already are better enforced. Yeah. Right. So I mean, it's, really, it's always a complicated thing whenever you've got privacy and transparency as goals, and you just have to use the tools to the best of your ability, but they're much better tools now. And I, and, I, and I think that, that, that you actually, you, you said another interesting point because you said you're, you're building something on top of the blockchain, so with the, with the hashes that you anchor within the blockchain, but how do we know that the, the thing that you build on top of it is uh, secure and can be trusted? Oh, that's a really awesome question. Yeah, so I didn't really talk about the consensus mechanism for Factum. So Factum is distributed also. It's a distributed hash table. You can look up every single record as a hash in Factum. Um, it runs its own fully distributed system, and it's got its own consensus algorithm, and it's got its own node network and that kind of thing. Uh, I just didn't want to get too deep into the technical weeds here. Who, who, who controls those nodes? Who runs uh, those It's nodes? distributed, right? So, so we will be handpicking, it's a federated system, we'll be handpicking those first ones, and then there's a voting mechanism that kicks in. So it turns out that the, the way it's built is the users of Factum end up voting for who those servers are. 
So it's a it's a pretty elegant solution, but it takes a while to explain. Okay, it's, it's, it sounds, sounds really interesting, but I'll, yeah. I'll just... <laughs> <laughs> At some point, we can't geek out too much about consensus algorithms, because we'll lose everybody. Thank you. Thanks for a wonderful presentation. Oh, thanks, guys. <laughs> um, I heard uh, there's going to be a crowd sale soon, and there will be uh, tokens for sale called factoids. Can you, can you tell us a little bit about yeah, that? Yeah, absolutely. That so, one of the... One of the strange and wonderful opportunities that open source in the 21st century presents is this idea that you can have a financial mechanism that funds open source projects in perpetuity, right? And the absolute best example of that is Bitcoin, where Bitcoin is an open source system that rewards the people that run the hardware, right? Those are the miners and they get uh, block rewards. So uh, built on that same idea, the only way to decentralize this system for real is you have to have the protocol, the actual software, pay the hardware, um, uh, the hardware backbone. And in order to do that, you have to have a token, right? And it turns out that the token's really useful because we can take the token, exchange it um, in a one-way transaction for those entries, and you can have uh, the users, the banks, the insurance companies, whoever wants to build on top of Factum, um, just by entries, and that how, that's how it isolates them. So we're doing a crowd sale. It's going to be in the Q2 of 2015. We haven't announced the official date. Uh, factoids will be available for sale. All of the funds raised there go to uh, the Factum Foundation. It becomes the endowment for basically building the better and better open source software moving forward. More questions? Go for it. Um, based on your presentation, what is the data store? Is this consensus that you say before, or who is going to store the data and make sure that it's available? I don't know. Hundred years from now. So, uh, so the question is, where's the data stored? So, um, uh, let me clarify. If you're taking a document and hashing it and putting that hash in the fact of, you're keeping your private data private, right? Mm -hmm. So, uh, like a like an auditing piece of software, an accounting piece of software wouldn't would still run its same database and just send hashes into Factum. The way the Factum hashes are they're distributed around nodes. And they're in a distributed hash table. In fact, right now, I think we also just put them up on the torrent network. Um, so there will be, as long as there is somebody who is using Factum, there is incentive to keep those nodes open, right? And the nodes of those hashes, of that distributed hash table, is freely, you know, you can publish it anywhere. You can put it in Amazon Web Server. You can put it uh, up on the torrent network. There's many, many, many ways to put that up. But we want to make sure that that data is always available. That's that's sort of the, the key to the whole thing. But they're hashes, so it's a pretty small amount of data. Right. Those, uh, those servers that were selected, are they those, uh, those determine that the data is available? Because you can't prove that something is in there without having the data. Maybe if I'm repeating someone else's question. Uh, so the can, can you ask that question one more time, then I'll see if I can repeat it. How do you know if the data is available? Because if you, you could just put in some uh, some hash in Merkle root in the blockchain, but not have to give the data to anyone else, and, it could, and you could claim something is in there that isn't really. So, um, okay, so the problem, you're, you're asking the problem of garbage data. What do you do with, like, how do you prove that somebody's not just dumping random data in, right? Um, so, in, in this situation, there's always somebody with the data and somebody who wants to know who, who about that data, right? And they're proving, they're taking, this person's taking their data, they're hashing it, they're putting it into Factum, so basically they're time stamping it. And then they're doing proof of process, so they show that how that time, how they hash changes or doesn't change over time. So that sort of creates the record keeping. And then at some point, the third party that wants to do some kind of auditing process on it would need to reach out to them and say, hey, prove that that hash matches the data that you have, right? And there's all sorts of cryptographic games you can play in order to do that, but basically the easiest way is, here's that same document, put in the same set of metadata, and it should be able to recreate that same hash, right? Or you could do some sort of randomized thing which would allow you to not show the whole amount, but still prove that you have it, right? So. Uh, this goes back to that garbage in, garbage out problem. At some point, you have to trust somebody putting data in 
but the idea is that it's a third party validated and verified, or in a trustless way. Okay. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Every uh, the the meta fields and so uh, without getting too much into the how it works, uh, you create your own chains and you define what goes into those chains uh, of data, and you can basically say, you know, there's going to be some standard data, metadata like time stamping, but you could also say, hey, if you do not have all six of these records, it's not valid, and you can run uh, real time model processes against that. So. You could say, in order for this record to be valid, it has to have a timestamp also, right? So, so there's ways to, you always want to timestamp it, but there's also ways to real-time audit that everything, all, everything goes in correctly. More questions? No? Oh, go for it. Yeah. Here. I'll just do this thing. So, um, what kind of hashing algorithm are you trusting? And are you only using one hashing algorithm? Um, so, I don't care how somebody hashes their data as long as they, when, when somebody goes to recreate that same hash, they do, this, they use the same algorithm, right? All I care about is the structure of the hash, and if it's just small enough, big enough. And I don't remember the size of the left my head, I think it's like 32 bytes or something. But, um, like, I don't care how they get there as long as they can recreate it, right? It's everybody's, you know, ha like if I hand you a hash, it's like a fingerprint. It proves that you're there, but I can't recreate the person from the fingerprint. Well, yeah, um, unless the, the hashing function is broken, then they can recreate the fingerprint from any arbitrary data, pretty much, right? Yeah, so I would trust people to use working hashed <laughs> hash algorithms, right? And, and um, there's a pretty good body of knowledge about which, which to use. I just, I'm not the expert. So, yeah, because the, the, the whole deal about hashing functions is that they can be secure right now, but in 10 years, 20 years, they do not. So. Um, because the hashing algorithm breaks down? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I, unfortunately, I'm, I can't speak intelligently about that. I would assume that the people who really care about getting their data right would really care about solving that problem. Okay. Anybody else? Yes. No? Um, well, fantastic. Uh, so I'm going to be around this evening for any additional questions if you want to grab me. Um, the other thing is if you're interested in Factum, uh, there's a couple of cool use case videos at factum.org, uh, which is our site. And if you're interested in you know, introducing us to any businesses or, or being part of our community, uh, reach out to me. I'm Peter at factum.org. Okay. Thanks so much, guys. Bitcoin Wednesday.